Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on uh, where you're tuning in from. Welcome to Unleashed, where we're bringing world-class thought leaders into your living room or your kitchen or wherever you have your laptop set up uh, every Thursday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. I'm your host, Jeff Tetz. I'm the CEO of a company called Results. And our whole mission as an organization is just try to make it easier for you to build a great company in good times and bad. And that's why we started Unleashed. Uh, this is episode number five. And I want to thank uh, everyone that's joining us and welcome you to the show, whether you're, you've been here for all five of them or you're a first timer. We aim to bring you uh, incredible topics with world-class thought leaders uh, every single Thursday. And uh, today we have some really special news. We're running a contest. I know some of you may have just tuned in because you heard we were having a contest last minute and uh, everyone's welcome. The more the merrier. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, and it's only going to work as well as the audience uh, decides, uh, decides to interact with, the, uh, with it. So we're going to run a shop local contest. And it doesn't matter where you live. You can live in Chicago. You can live in Vancouver, or Calgary, Edmonton, wherever you might be. Uh, we're going to do a shop local uh, contest where basically if you post to uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram using the hashtag results unleashed, with some kind of a tidbit, tool, a tip, something that you learned from today's episode. Uh, we're going to actually uh, put one entry form into the contest for every post that you make. And we're gonna make a draw uh, tomorrow at noon. So get those posts going uh, on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter using the hashtag results unleashed, anything that you've learned or picked up from today. And we will contact the winner tomorrow at noon and you will choose a shop local store of your uh, choosing and you'll receive a $50 gift card. We'll do some fun, uh, we'll do some fun things around the announcement for that. Uh, and it'll also be a great way for you to help to spread, uh, spread the message of what we're doing here uh, every Thursday. So some, uh, some housekeeping pieces, there's two different places where you can interact during the show today. There is the chat box where everybody's saying where they're from and, and we'll post little reminders during the, uh, during the episode. But if you actually wanna get some questions in for Megan Burns this morning, you have to put those questions in the specific Q and A box. So look at the bottom of your screen. There's a chat box and there is a Q and A box. Put your questions in the Q and A. And if we don't happen to get to your questions on the air today, you can send those to us via email using info at unleashresults.com and we will promise to get back to you promptly and we will send your questions to Megan. And you may see our, uh, our show pro, uh, producer, Sean Fitzgerald, posting comments from time to time as he's pulling the uh, strings behind the scenes for us uh, for today. Now, the other thing I want to uh, want to stress and emphasize is when the show is over and you go to leave, please do not just close your browser. There will be a continue button when you go to leave the, uh, leave the episode at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Click on the continue button. That's going to take you to a feedback, uh, a feedback page. And not only will you be able to give us some feedback, but you will also be able to put your name in for a special draw that Megan Burns is doing for a customer experience assessment and evaluation. And we have some other special offers that we're going to make as well. And so before we dive into today's episode, I don't want to miss a chance to also give you a special sneak peek to what we're doing next Thursday. We're very lucky to have Sarah Noel Wilson joining us, and we're going to talk about connection in a disconnected time. Another very important topic. Sarah Noel Wilson, her Twitter game is strong. Uh, we'll show you how to find her when the show is over today. She has her Master's of Science in Leadership Development. I didn't, I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, so it's going to be a wonderful conversation. So now on with today's episode. Today, we are discussing stepping up your customer experience game. And uh, we're so grateful to be joined by customer experience strategist Megan, Megan Burns. She works with companies to build a robust system for customer experience management. She is a speaker and a strategy consultant who spends most of her time helping companies master the art and the science of customer experience management. She's worked with hundreds of Fortune 500 firms in healthcare, telecom, logistics, technology, and financial services, building growth-driven, world-class customer experience programs. And she's spent uh, a decade leading customer experience maturity work at Forrester Research. And when she was there, 
she had a big role in creating the first ever Forrester customer experience maturity model. It's a mouthful. It's a really important model. And she'll talk about some of those things on the show today. Uh, and she also helped to uh, create the customer experience index benchmark. She's, a spear, uh, she's appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Ad Age, and B2B Magazine, among others. And when she's not working, she loves reading, watching documentaries, and exploring historic towns in the greater Boston area, one of my favorite cities uh, where she resides. So welcome, Megan. And, and why don't we uh, get started? Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit how you got started in this industry and why you do what you do? Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, and hello, everybody uh, who's on the line. So my route to customer experience, it wasn't like I woke up one day as a kid and said, I want to be a customer experience strategist, right? There was no such thing. Uh, I actually started in software engineering, but I was always that weird kid that liked English and history as much as I liked math and science. So through the course of my education and then my first job, I ended up focusing on a part of software engineering that is all about the people and who's using a piece of software and what does it have to do and requirements engineering. And usability, user experience was a big piece of that conversation in the early 2000s. And I was kind of in the right place at the right time in 2009, actually spurred on by the last recession, when companies started to realize that your website doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so customer experience became this bigger, broader, enterprise level concern, strategic level concern, that I was like, yes, it's about time. Let's, let's fix this. Excellent. So business leaders, and I'm a, you know, a, a business owner, a business leader, one of the things that's important to us is we sort of want the, the Big Mac to taste the same in, and McDonald's is not a sponsor, but we want the Big <laughs> Mac to taste the same in Moscow as it does in Vancouver. You know, we want the customer smiles. We want the unsolicited social media endorsements, uh, but those those always seem to me like they're so um, they're so spontaneous and organic when they happen. And if you start to put a process around those things, it seems overly mechanical to me. And 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 almost the risk would be that you would suck the spirit out of that. So are you here to tell us that that's actually not the case? Uh, it is absolutely uh, the case. the The key is balance. And this is something, you know, with every company I work with, I can usually tell going in, uh, if they're a pro I'm an engineer by training. So if they're a process oriented company, they tend to have lots of process and not enough empathy. So things are really robotic. Uh, there are other companies that have a ton of empathy, but no process. And I actually had one, uh, the chief customer officer of a company that is worldwide known for being great at customer experience, tell me we're really good in spite of ourselves. He said, our people are heroes. They will do whatever it takes to serve the customer. But we force them to take heroic measures way too often because we're not coordinated internally. So it's definitely a fine line. And that's part of, frankly, why this is so hard. Uh, but, it, you know, hard things are fun to take on. Yeah, absolutely. I know we're going to cover all that today. Right now, well, let, the floor is yours, Megan. So I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm really excited to dive into your, uh, to your presentation this morning. Sure. Well, it's, it's not going to be too much presentation. It's hopefully going to be a little bit more uh, conversational. Uh, but I wanted to just, for everybody, I know we have some folks who are perhaps new to the customer experience field. And customer experience is one of those things. Um, it's kind of like the song, Jesse's Girl. I don't know if you remember that song. Absolutely. There's a, there's a game that says, okay, sing the words to Jesse's Girl. Because if you ask people, do you know the words? Everyone says yes. And then if you put them on the spot and ask them to do karaoke, they find out they don't actually know the words. And customer experience is kind of like that and the definition. Um, so I like to start just by defining what customer experience is and how it relates to things like customer service and marketing and brand. Um, customer experience is how a person perceives their interactions with a business. And there are a couple of words. The, the amount of time that went into creating this definition is not represented by the number of words. Um, there are some really key points of this. Uh, the first one is the word person. Uh, I know we have some business to business, some business to consumer folks, but humans have experiences. So no matter what industry you're in, there is always a person 
having the experience. The second word that's really important is interactions. Any time a company and a customer interact, whether it's a website, a call, you know, back in the day and hopefully in the future, face-to-face, all of those interactions are part of the customer experience. And 10 years ago, people would say, oh, customer experience, you mean customer service. And that was sort of a narrow function, maybe the call center or the contact center. And customer experience covers everything, soup to nuts. And then the last piece is this word perceives. Because uh, I work with a lot of companies that have a ton of data, lots of analytics. And we have to kind of bring out the fact that uh, it doesn't matter what actually happened. It matters how the customer thinks and feels about what happened. So I was talking to the communications team of a company one day and they said, oh, well, you know, we sent out a bunch of these emails, but customers misclassified them as marketing emails. I said, no, if the customer thought they were marketing emails, that's what they were, whether you intended it to be or not. So it's this idea that stepping back and thinking about what is it like to do business with our company for a customer and how do we use that uh, at a minimum to maintain good relationships. And for some companies, frankly, um, they use it as a strategic advantage. If you've ever heard uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, people ask him, why do you think you're so successful? And he says, because we've been obsessively focused on nothing but customer experience from the beginning. So once we think about what customer experience is, the question I also get a lot is, so what, right? It, is, this, is this, why is this a thing all of a sudden? Uh, you know, how you treat customers has always been a, an important part of business. And there was something really interesting that happened uh, 10 years ago. And it's, it's actually relevant because I think we're at a similar moment now, which is that, um, in the recession, the Great Recession, uh, companies that had been primarily focused on uh, acquiring new customers, either by acquiring companies or just by spewing marketing campaigns, that was no longer an option. So they had to think about how do we retain our existing customers because we can't just replace them with new people that we haven't annoyed away from our business. Um, at the same time, you had social media and mobile coming together, and that was really the sweet spot when people could not only tell a thousand friends about their customer experience, uh, but do so immediately without any cooling off period. They didn't have to go home. That freaked a lot of business owners out because suddenly the impact of one bad experience could be you know, completely outsized. And then you had the emergence uh, and, and the rise of companies like Amazon who were using customer experience as an advantage and quite frankly, changing the definition of what good means for everybody's customers, right? That this is part of what makes this tricky is that customers want everything to be as easy as Amazon. I hear a lot, I can track my pizza from Domino's with more granularity than I can track my shipment of supplies that's you know tens of thousands or millions of dollars. Uh, and so those things coming together made customer experience a big deal. But what we didn't have at the time was proof. We didn't have data actually showing that if you focus on customer experience and invest in it, it will come back to the bottom line. We have that data now. And there's some really uh, powerful data that my team and I, when I was still at Forrester, pulled together. We looked at a bunch of different industries, and this comes off that customer experience index benchmark um, that I used to run, which by the way, I know a lot of folks here from Canada, there is a Canadian version for Canadian companies. Um, we looked at in a given industry, if there was one company that had a clearly leading customer experience, uh, and the rest of them were sort of further in the back. We looked at the difference in growth from 2010 to 2014 or 15 between those companies. And you can see from the graph, what we found was interestingly, you can still grow with a bad customer experience, right? Even coming out of a recession. But the companies that are thoughtful and deliberate about their customer experience grow 
faster. Overall, it was 17% growth versus 3% growth. And in specific industries, uh, TV service, if you think about it during this time, it was really when uh, Netflix and cord cutting was, was coming up. Um, and so that dynamic of a different customer experience and one that people like a lot better uh, was, was shifting the entire landscape of business models and industry dynamics. So the, the what is customer experience and the why, in some ways it's universal, but in some ways it's also a, a brand new challenge. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm interested, Megan. So growing, you sort of mentioned that you can still grow through bad customer experiences. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Um, I wouldn't say you can grow through bad experiences. Okay. You can go despite, despite, despite okay. um, yeah. bad experiences. So um, it, customers, depending on your industry and depending on the situation, um, are willing to put up with a lot of stuff uh, in business to business. Uh, if you serve businesses versus consumers, their expectations, it would be nice if it could be as easy as Amazon, but they kind of know that it's more complicated. So if you have more complex processes and things like that, people aren't going to get as frustrated or, you know, just leave. And rarely do we have one sort of inciting moment where that, that's the customer experience that sent me running to your competitors. Um, there is a gradual chipping away though, sort of a death by a thousand cuts, that at some point, if they're ever approached by a competitor, either they get fed up and go actively looking, or if they get approached by a competitor, um, they are kind of ripe for the pickings because they're, uh, they're fed up with the other organization. And it's different in every industry. This is one of the really, the, the degree to which customer experience drives purchase decisions, actually varies by industry, uh, but it's, it's a factor and a non-trivial factor for everybody. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll um, talk about how do you manage customer experience? And this is one of those things that uh, I think gets lost sometimes is the idea that customer experience has always existed, but we haven't managed it. You think about the level of discipline that people have for operations and finance and product development and things like that. Um, you know, those are things that are explicitly managed and customer experience has not had that same degree of rigor. So when companies are looking to get started with this, the first thing I tell them is the ultimate goal is to build a system. And you mentioned this in the beginning. Uh, but early on, it's just to start thinking about your world and seeing your business from the customer's perspective. So I always like to have people start out with a tool called an empathy map. Um, and if your customers are humans, which everyone's are, um, this works. And an empathy map is a really simple template. Uh, it starts with the customer at the center because that's the person having the experience. And then it asks you to write down for a given interaction that your company is gonna have with them, let's think about their context, right? Where are they? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? Uh, what are they saying out loud? And the value of that information, I think, has been driven um, ridiculously home lately by everybody's change in work situations, right? So uh, we used to talk about, I used to talk about the fact that your clients may be traveling. And so if you have a, a complex process and they're sitting in an airport with headphones on, you know, that impacts their experience, whether you intended it to or not. Uh, now, so many other things are changing, but just taking that perspective of the customer and putting yourself in their shoes, it doesn't matter how empathetic a person you are, that's hard. It's just something that the brain struggles with. We tend to see things our way and assume that everybody else does too. So an empathy map is a tool to bring some more rigor to that process. 
And I don't know, do we have an example of an empathy map template? I thought we might. Yes, there we go. Okay, so you can see, and I can make this template available. You know, who is the person? Um, what are they seeing and hearing from you, from other people, right? What's the environment? What are they thinking? Uh, which it's really interesting. What someone is thinking about can be um, positive and negative at the same time. This is something that a lot of people don't think about. You can be scared and excited. What is the person feeling? And then what are they actually saying out loud? Because their experience is all of those things. We only have explicit visibility into one or two of them, but we can take steps to manage the other ones or account for the other ones uh, in a really conscious and deliberate way. So that's a fun, simple little exercise that you can do in about 15 minutes. It's also really fun to have multiple team members do it. Yeah. Well, and that, and at the risk of asking a silly question, I think uh, I ask a lot of them, but I was going to ask, so yeah, who does fill this out? But then how do you also, how do you ensure that the information you're, that you're putting on to this, uh, this map is, is actually reflective and accurate of what your customers are really experiencing? Well, that's a great question. It's not a silly question at all. And it's, um, that's where the systems come in, right? So step one is recognizing that we need to have this understanding as an asset for our company so that we can look at our business from the customer's perspective. You always start out with, well, what do we think it is, right? Because you can't go in and tell people you don't know your customers. Uh, trust yeah. me, they, they don't like you when you do that. Uh, and it's not completely true, but everybody has a perspective. So doing this with a whole team, I do this a lot with executive teams, and it is amazing how radically different they perceive the same exact customer to be. And then the process becomes actually asking customers these questions, validating these things and saying, is this actually your experience? Uh, and that's sort of the, the ongoing challenge is how do we keep up with understanding how customers' worlds are changing and their expectations are changing? Um, so doing these periodically, most companies have kind of a, a cadence of research, of customer research that's constantly feeding into this. Uh, sometimes it's a research project where you go out and actually look at a particular thing. Sometimes it's picking up trends in what's going on in social media. The technology is hugely um, beyond anything we could have ever thought in terms of helping us be able to do that. So it, it is, it's why this is a system and not just a project. Excellent. And as we're, uh, just as we're getting back to the slides, I want to remind people, if you have questions for Megan, put them in the Q&A box. <clears throat> We've got questions coming in now. We'll start to get to those very soon. And the other thing I want to remind you of that we are running a contest online. If you use the hashtag results unleashed and post something that you've taken away from this episode today on Instagram, on Twitter, or on LinkedIn, you get one entry form to win a $50 gift card to a shop local store of your choosing that will draw tomorrow at noon. So anyways, back to the slides. No problem. And I just want to, to the, the point that um, someone that you just asked, uh, another key piece of a customer experience program is a feedback loop. Just being able to say, hey, uh, how was your experience? And react to that. Uh, when I started in this field, you would be amazed at the size of companies that had absolutely no way systematically to tell that someone was having a bad experience and actually do something about it. So it doesn't have to be fancy. It, it can be a survey. It doesn't have to be. Some companies just meet uh, once or twice a week with their frontline employees and say, hey guys, what are you hearing? Or if you have something like this, uh, if somebody has an issue, some CEOs have taken to giving out their phone number and saying, you know what, call me directly and we'll work on it. Um, sometimes it's a symbolic gesture, but most of the time uh, it's a way to ensure that if a problem in the experience does happen, I should say when, because it will, um, you have a way to know and react to it. And that safety net is something that needs to be there on an ongoing basis in your business you want to go beyond that because 
just responding to things that already happened, right? You've already incurred some of the damage. And also you're going to start to see patterns to say, hey, you know, 50% of our customers are having a problem with this thing. We can fix that and, and solve that problem, prevent that problem from happening. Um, Sprint did that a couple of years ago. And, and just by addressing solvable problems, like problems they kind of created in the first place, uh, they managed to save eight, $1.8 billion over seven years just by wrecking. It wasn't about how do we serve customers better when they call. It was about how do we make it so they don't have to call at all. And that was just by being aware of and conscious. Um, PayPal did something similar. They found 20 pain points in their customer process at one point. And by fixing those pain points, the volume of payments that went up uh, for them was, I think, about $2.3 billion. Obviously, those are really big companies with, with really big numbers, but just having this consistent way to capture customer feedback and feed it into an action system is hugely, hugely beneficial. Absolutely. Well, and that's consistent with the pattern that we see amongst uh, organizations that grow and keep market share. Not only are they, have they identified a specific problem that they're solving in a unique way, but, but they're doing it in such a manner that they're constantly removing friction from, from the customer experience. So that lines up really well uh, with that, Megan. And Megan, I might just take this chance to go to, uh, to, go to at least one question from the Q&A. And Laura has a question around Net Promoter Score. So how does Net Promoter Score apply to gauging the customer experience? And, and then this is, a, we get this question a lot because we do this with our clients, is how accurate do you think the data and information is from Net Promoter Score? Okay. I'm, I love this question. I'm how I answer it all the time. Uh, I'm going to put on my engineer nerd hat for a little while and just get really specific. Um, net promoter score is likelihood to recommend. That question existed before Fred Reichheld and Bain put together NPS. It is a general question. When that metric first came out, the idea behind it was um, if you are not measuring anything, measure this one thing as a proxy for whether or not your customers are happy with doing business with you and if they're going to help you drive organic growth. Uh, so there was this misperception for many years that uh, because it was called the ultimate question, that it was the only question. Not even Fred thought that to be true. Yeah. Um, net promoter score, also the likelihood to recommend score, it is an outcome of an experience. So airlines are great. No, nobody's flying right now, but they're a great example of this, where if you've flown an airline for years and they're really good and you have one bad experience, you know, okay, stuff happens. You're still as likely to recommend them. But it's being able to see that, hey, this person is having not so great experiences over and over. It's a leading indicator of dragging that net promoter score down. So measuring the actual customer experience quality and the likelihood to recommend uh, is a really powerful one, too. On the flip side, most companies need what I call a beacon metric, a rallying cry, that one number. I mean, I've seen it so many times. I tell people you know, you don't necessarily need a one number and they won't listen to anything about more detailed metrics until they have that rallying cry number. And NPS is phenomenal for that. Uh, but the question I always ask clients that use NPS is, okay, your goal is to improve net promoter score. Are you going to do that by increasing promoters or decreasing detractors? And how do you, how do you answer that? Uh, we, we talk about it, but honestly, most people have never thought about it that way. Uh, they've never thought about it that deliberately. Uh, it depends on where you are uh, and, and what your goal is. It is easier to reduce detractors than it is to create promoters. Uh, but depending on, on sort of where you are and how good you are uh, to begin with, I have some clients that came to me and said, we will be out of business even before COVID-19. We will be out of business if we don't stop driving our customers away. And then other companies were saying, hey, we have loyal customers. The world is changing. We want to keep them loyal. How do we use this idea of customer experience to sort of step up our game? 
So a lot of it is company specific. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we use this tool actually religiously. We ask our own clients every 90 days. One, one of the themes that's emerged amongst our client groups that use this survey tool as well is the detractors can be a good indication of we knew better. We probably should not have worked with that customer to begin with. So there can be some good indications uh, there that come through the data. There's, there's um, a couple of questions, one from Tor and one from John that come in back to the empathy map. So, and I think they're, they're, they're quick hitters and great questions. So would you have clients fill out the empathy map? And then how does the empathy map generate data when it seems very experiential? Oh, both good questions. Um, I would absolutely have clients fill out an empathy map. Um, more often than not, that's actually executed through research and observational interviews. So you don't actually put the document in front of them, but you, you observe people, you talk to people, they tell you, and you, you fill it out in here. That's a lot of what uh, ethnographic research, qualitative research does and is about. Um, the other question, uh, experiential, yes, this is qualitative, absolutely qualitative data. Um, you will start to see patterns very quickly and themes very quickly when you're doing uh, qualitative research with a, a reasonable sample of customers. Um, one way that some companies are generating data, there are certainly analytics you can track about what are they seeing or hearing. So some companies are tracking uh, uses of words or how long is a pause in calls when somebody is on the phone with one of their employees. Technology can do that. Some companies are taking email conversations and social media and running it through text analytics and generating uh, metrics on what percentage of people were confused, what percentage of people were happy. Um, so there is technology that enables you to do that. Uh, but it's not necessarily just about the data. Um, it's about helping your people think about and be more attuned to basically be more emotionally intelligent in interactions and when they're designing interactions like the people who do your website or something like that uh, this is one of the things when i was a software engineer i was constantly reminding my technical colleagues that there was a human being on this website and just because we could implement that cool fun feature doesn't mean we should because the person didn't need it or didn't understand it. Um, and so having um, what we call customer personas uh, helps bring that home. Excellent. I, I wanna go to one last question before we get back to the content of, of your presentation, Megan, and it comes from Jeff. I uh, love the name. Uh, companies that are, that are leaders in customer experience grow faster than laggards was, was one of the data points that you had. So th they tend to be good at lots of different things, not just you know, customer experience and customer service. So is there a chance they're good at all parts of their business, including customer experience, and that's why they grow the collective? Or in your research and in the data, were you able to actually isolate customer service as a factor and measure growth based on that? So it's a good question and it's a complex one, but uh, I thought it was a question worth bringing up. It is a good question. And this is where that customer experience equals customer service mindset will get you in trouble. Um, there are some companies where their customer experience innovation, what they did differently was also a business model innovation, right? So the idea of an online only bank ING Direct was one of the first ones to do that. Some people would argue that that was worse customer service, but it was a better customer experience for people who wanted a certain type of thing and didn't need a certain type of other thing. So companies that are um, able to think that way and actually use customer experience to guide their business strategy and their product decisions, um, that's a, a piece of this puzzle. You can't be good at customer experience without being good at some other things uh, like operations. Uh, and very often companies will, will marry these two. So um, uh, Delta Airlines, I, I have always used them because they're a great transformation example, but this is true of uh, Cisco and some other big companies. Uh, they have operations data that says, well, how often does something go wrong? And then they have customer data that says, how did somebody feel when that thing went wrong? And so they can marry it up and say, all right, how long is too long to get back to a customer? 
And those operational uh, service level agreements are set not by some arbitrary number, but by we know this is the customer's tipping point, right? So it's um, because customer experience touches so many parts of the business, uh, it, is, it is absolutely true that being good at those things and being good at um, other things is, is part of it. But you see this a lot in industries where there's a lot of sameness. So in financial services, um, a checking account is a checking account is a checking account. And if you look at why people choose certain financial institutions over others, how easy is it going to be? How much of a, you know, if I run into a problem, do I think uh, it's going to be fairly easy to resolve with them? When the products and services are relatively the same, the experience or what you expect the experience to be can be the tiebreaker. In some cases, people will actually take a worse product for a better customer experience. Wow, that's something. So as we get back to your, uh, your presentation, Megan, uh, I wanna remind people, lots of questions coming in. Please put the questions into the Q&A box. It's a, separate, uh, it's a separate panel for you to make sure that your questions get to Megan. And if we can't answer them on the air, we will get to you if you email them, uh, info at unleashedresults.com. We promise to get back to you. Yeah. Um, so uh, just picking up where, where I had left off, um, we were talking about a feedback loop one of the things that's a really good way to sort of put boundaries on that feedback loop is what's called a customer journey map. This is the thing, if people have heard of anything from customer experience, this is the thing they've typically heard of. Uh, and the, when you start them, they're super low tech. It, but it, a customer journey is a piece of a customer experience. It's the steps that a customer takes to accomplish a specific goal. Right? So if you are a supplier, you might have someone who is sourcing potential suppliers, and that's one journey. And then the process of actually contracting with you, that's another journey. And most companies, what they have are process maps. And process maps are useful, but they are inside out. And they don't necessarily show what your customer, how your customer is seeing this pile of spaghetti of business processes that you have evolved over the years. And so customer journey maps are a really powerful tool for saying, how do we look to customers? And when I do them with clients, I usually do an empathy map first to get people in that headspace. And then we move on to mapping the customer journey. And the way I, I explain it to people is uh, pretend you're a golf announcer watching your customer do whatever they're doing and narrating it. And other people are putting that stuff up on the board with sticky notes. That gives you a way to see, uh, I had one client where, you know, there was this huge process. Yeah, here's some visual examples of them. There yep. was this huge set of stuff that had to happen behind the scenes, all of which was necessary. And the journey mapping exercise exposed that the customer had no idea any of that was going on. They were just waiting. What's the customer doing at this point in the process? Waiting. What are they doing at this point? Still waiting. Right. And so being able to look for opportunities where you can tweak the perception, right? You don't necessarily have to change the process, but you can do things to make the perception of the process better, easier, more confidence building. And journey mapping helps you find opportunities to do that, as well as finding places where, you know, that's not my department. That's a classic issue that, that journey maps come together because the customer doesn't care. Um, and it also is really helpful in showing, I talked about uh, earlier when employees are heroes, I've done maps where the customer is happy. The journey looks really good, but the employees who are serving them are miserable because they have to, they're taking on all the complexity and the pain on behalf of the customer and that's not sustainable. Employee experience is a big piece of, of customer experience, especially now. Uh, and so you can map an employee experience, an employee journey, just as easily as you can map a customer journey. Excellent. Okay. 
So I think the last um, thing that I'll say in terms of uh, prepared remarks is just to recognize the fact that this is hard and getting harder. Right? This goes back to the customer, the idea that customer experience is not new. That's true. But even when I started in this field in 2006, there was no iPhone. Right? Think about that for a minute. Think about how different people's expectations were. So in order to deliver a, a simple, easy experience in a world where, you know, even as a small business, I'm a business of one. I have to have a website. I have email, I have uh, you know, the actual materials that I send out to people. There's just a lot more that needs coordinating. And so when you start to talk about and approach people in your company about needing a customer experience program, I always approach it from the perspective of, uh, this has always been important, we've done the best we could, but it's harder now. And so we need a more disciplined approach to help our caring, empathetic employees execute in a system that has a lot of complexity. Right, yeah. So Megan, one of the questions I think most of us have right now is uh, everything is, most, most interactions have moved to a virtual platform for the time being. So what are, what are some of the consistent patterns that you're seeing that, are, that have to be different in how we engage with customers in this, uh, in this new reality? Um, that's a, 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 it's a great question. It's pretty much the main question I've been talking about. Um, what I like to do is step back and look at what the customer's goal was, because that probably hasn't changed. Yeah. Right? I need to feed my family. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm getting groceries from a grocery store or from a restaurant that can't do dine-in service, so they're passing it, right? the, the customer's goal is the same. Um, when we move things on to digital channels, there are a, a couple of things that happen. One is we lose that emotional connection. Um, it's very hard. And even in email, humans are notoriously bad at guessing the emotion that someone meant to convey in an email. And they've done this with best friends. They've done this with spouses. You send an email thinking you know the tone that it's going to be read in someone else reads it totally, barely better than chance that they're gonna correctly guess the tone. So we have to be more thoughtful, we have to be more deliberate about word choice, um, about conveying uh, emotion. Um, one of the companies I work with, it's a very large company, so this took like eight months to approve, but they just got the ability to use emojis in responding to people in social media. Emojis, as silly as they seem, and some people have said they're unprofessional, I disagree, they are enormously powerful, right? If you're sending a customer something or they're asking a question and you reply with a smile, that's not too terribly ambiguous, right? So thinking about how do we convey that emotion and also how do we anticipate that emotion um, from other people? This is also where I think understanding that when people are anxious, which most people are right now, they get tunnel vision. So one of the things I've been working with clients on is let's go look at your website. Let's go look at the letters and the content that you send to customers. Give it a Marie Kondo, right? Take everything out and then put back the things that are most important because this is not necessarily the time to flood customers with a ton of marketing messages. Um, they're not going to see it and they could miss the fact that you have a service or they could go to your website and say, I don't know where to go to solve this problem. That should be the first thing you put on your website and nothing else gets on there until there are four or five places where a customer can go, Oh, I need to, fill in the blank goal. I will go here, right? So we're not in the moment with a customer. We can't do that back and forth. We have to anticipate more of that uh, in the design process. Yeah, that's great advice. Those are just a few. A few yeah, things. that's great advice. In some of your work, Megan, you talk about hidden forces that sabotage the customer experience. Can you elaborate on what those are? Mm, yes. Um, 
they can sabotage the customer experience and they can sabotage the effort to get the customer experience better. Um, one of the big things is, is just scale. And it doesn't have to be that big of a scale. I mean, I tend to work with really big companies, but I've started more recently working with companies that are sort of in that tipping point growth mode um, where you get to the point where um, the right hand can't know everything the left hand is doing. And in some companies, the right hand doesn't even know the left hand exists. I once had a, a supplier when I was at AT&T um, throw a conference to bring together these six different groups within our company that were all working on similar projects because the vendor knew all of us and we didn't even know that the other people existed, right? So just this ability to, to understand and find information uh, and how that ends up playing out is that companies think the answer is to care more or to tell people you have to collaborate instead of saying, well, how about we help you collaborate by helping you find uh, people in the organization that are doing similar things. One company, they looked at, well, what, when that works, when that goes right, what, how does that happen? And it turned out it was mostly people who'd been there for 30 years because those people knew somebody in every department and felt comfortable enough going, I don't know who this belongs to, but I can call so-and-so and, you know, they'll help me trace it down. So they started making training for new people like the first couple of weeks, just building those connections and having people get to know each other so that that organic, to your point about organic versus process, you know, you can put it in the process that you need to reach out to other groups. But if you don't know anybody in that group and you're new to the organization, you might not follow that process versus, okay, I'm not afraid to call so-and-so and say, I have no idea who does this. Can you help me figure it out? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we have lots of questions coming into the Q&A, so that's great. Keep them coming. As I said, if we don't get to all of them, uh, we'll do our best to answer them offline. You can also send those questions to info at unleashresults.com and we will absolutely get those to Megan. So Ed has a question here. Seems like good customer service is not in everyone's DNA. How do you find people that will provide stellar customer service and how much can it be coached into people? Oh, this is a great question. I get this all the time. Um, you're right. There's a quote from Herb Kelleher, who was the founder of Southwest Airlines, who said, I can't teach people customer service. Their parents do that. <laughs> As someone who can't, I am the, I am the parent, I am the child of two people who spent their entire careers on the retail front lines. So I believe that to a certain extent. Um, uh, ideally, Yes, you absolutely want to hire for empathy and emotional intelligence. And we've seen more and more of that happening. In fact, I just posted for some of the industries that are not known for that, like telecom and technology, uh, there's been a trend to hire from the hospitality industry. We want people who have that innate sense of hospitality. Well, you know what? Those people are available. Um, but the reality is you're not going to fire everybody that works with you and start over again. So the empathy map is actually one way to do that. Empathy is an inborn skill. We do it babies at 18 months. Uh, if they see or hear another baby crying, instead of just crying themselves, they will instinctively reach out and soothe them. So empathy is something that we all have. Um, stress and distance and other factors squish it. So just creating an environment where people can tap into that more. Uh, I think uh, you have people who have been um, trained by environment to be apathetic. Um, you can make them not apathetic. I heard a, a, a bus driver recently on the news saying that he's always thought his job was really important. But right now, he was in New York City, um, you know, the connection that he has with these people that he's helping get around, he said, my job has never been more meaningful. And I think there's a lot of people who are, are like that. Um, and so tapping into people's natural empathy, um, if they don't have it, um, there are certain roles, you know, some, some people just don't have it. But in my experience, most people um, can cultivate it uh, if they need to. 
Yeah, no, that's, that's good advice. And uh, I think it's a related question, but, uh, but Jeff Spiro has got a question around how do you determine the line between developing process and automation versus the focusing on the human aspect, the person to person uh, interactions? Another good question. Um, the way I talk about that is, is empowerment with guardrails. Right. So there are certain things that either have to happen a certain way uh, or that customers expect to happen a certain way. And those are things you can specify in the process, but also giving people the latitude. So Ritz Carlton is the classic example of this. Or again, not the best example right now, but every, excuse me, every single person in Ritz Carlton has the authority to spend up to $2,000 to resolve a customer's issue. They don't want you to spend $2,000 to resolve every customer's issue, yeah. um, but they want you to have that freedom. And then what happens if you went you know, a little overboard, you don't get in trouble. You talk with your team about, well, what might've been a more proportional response? And so there's also this, this practicing of how do we deal with the scenarios within the framework. One company actually made a board game. I thought this was genius. They made a board game of their business and had like rolling dice. And that's how they would work with managers to anticipate wacky, random customer scenarios and sort of build that muscle of saying, how do we find the right way to adjust within the process uh, for specific situations? There's a great book um, by Barry Schwartz and Ken Sharp called Practical Wisdom. Uh, Barry Schwartz is the guy who wrote The Paradox of Choice. That's what it's, it's all about. It's about the fact that we exist in situations where you can't have rules for everything. And so we have to cultivate that ability to kind of find the right balance of things for a particular situation. Yeah, that's great. It reminds me of uh, Ali Stone and Tim Gordon of Original Jewels Restaurant Group have this saying that if your customers aren't getting what, what they expect and then some, you, uh, you may not have a process problem. It may be a purpose problem. And if you layer a process on the wrong person, you're going to get a very limited outcome. But if you, if you lead with purpose first, and that's sort of why you do what you do, and then provide some guidance and those, those, those guardrails that you talked about, Megan, that's, that's when the powerful uh, interactions um, uh, come into play. I think it was even in the book, Howard Schultz on the story of Starbucks mm -hmm. on onward, he was famously asked, well, geez, Howard, how, how in every location that I walk into, no matter where it is around the world, all of your baristas are smiling and happy. And he said, well, that's simple. We just hire people that smile and are happy. So it's, uh, that, that goes back to that point as well. So we got time for one last question from the, from the Q&A, Megan, and it comes from Rick. Uh, lots of examples of larger corporations, Sprint and Delta as an example, and they are phenomenal uh, uh, examples. Uh, but do you have suggestions for how does a typical small, medium-sized business, where do we start? So uh, uh, we take this in, we're excited, we've got questions. What are the next sort of two or three things that we should be doing as small and medium enterprise owners after this call? Yeah, that empathy map and journey map, anybody can do. It costs absolutely nothing. And I think people will be surprised even in a smaller organization, how much just sitting down and thinking about that or putting it on paper, uh, how valuable that is. Uh, another thing that I would suggest for, for small to mid-sized businesses is to actually do some of the things your customers do. Right. Very often we don't sit down and, and fill out our own forms or go through our own processes. So actually sitting down and saying, well, what does it look like? Or asking a friend or having someone to do that and come back to you and say, oh, hey, I didn't mean it to be that way. I never intended it to be that way. Um, but I think you can also, uh, and this is really important for small businesses, uh, for any business, um, Make sure you catalog the things you're getting right, because you're probably getting more of it right than wrong. Ironically, all these big companies want to create that small business feel just on a massive scale. So, you know, talk to customers and say, hey, you know, what is it like working with us? When I get uh, testimonials from clients, one of the questions I ask is, um, describe your experience working with Megan, because people pick up on things that I would never have thought of. And calling those out and helping your people, you know, reinforce 
yes, customers love us, but they love us specifically because of this thing that you may not have consciously tried to do or thought to do, but it's the thing that's making the difference. And that, that kind of positive feedback loop uh, is actually much easier for small businesses than it is for larger businesses. Yeah, well, well said. And as a reminder to everybody watching right now, we're running a contest. We're going to give away a $50 shop local gift card, no matter where you live in the world. This applies to you. All you have to do between now and noon mountain time tomorrow is go on to LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram and post something that you've learned today. Even if it's a question for Megan that you want to put on social media, use the hashtag results unleashed. You get an entry into the draw for every post that you make with the hashtag. We'll have some fun with the winner uh, and, and the shop local um, ch uh, choosing uh, uh, tomorrow when we do the draw. Uh, Megan, I'm also curious, just on a personal level, this has been a challenging time for everybody. What has been the most challenging time of this pandemic for you personally? That's a, oh, there's so many answers I could give. Um, if I had to pick the biggest one, it would be um, helping both myself and my clients deal with this feeling of just not knowing what's coming, not knowing what the right thing to do is and having a lot less control. So I'll give you an example. I have a, a client who is a manufacturer and their demand for their product skyrocketed and they absolutely wanted to get it to people. But if a country in their global supply chain suddenly closed one day, the promise they made yesterday was not a promise that they could end up keeping and it was, it was nothing in their fault, right? So helping people figure out how to be creative and think about if we can't do this, what can we do? Um, even when we're in this period where, you know, nobody knows what the right answer is from a, a customer experience perspective, because we've never been here before. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. Megan, it's been such a great, uh, uh, just a, a great opportunity to spend an hour with you today. Uh, we're just scratching the surface of your knowledge and your insights. And uh, so I want to encourage as we wrap up today is click the continue button when you end your session with us today, everybody. That's going to take you to the feedback, uh, the feedback page, where not only can you give us feedback on how to continue to improve and enhance these, uh, these, uh, these sessions, but we're also going to make available leadership team execution workshops for your own management team to help you continue this journey. Journey. And Megan has been so kind uh, that she is going to provide a draw for a 90 minute customer experience workshop with her directly. That is a $6,000 workshop. She's giving it away for free. All you have to do is uh, fill out the feedback form. Megan, thanks for doing that. Thanks for doing this. And everybody that tunes in, we're so glad to have you. And I hope to see you back next week where uh, Sarah Noel Wilson is going to be joining us for a conversation on connecting deeply in a time of massive disconnection. Look forward to seeing you next week. The link will be put up on our YouTube channel very shortly as well. And I wish everybody a great Thursday and look forward to seeing everybody very, very soon. Take care.